Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good afternoon. Um, hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, I'm Jamie Shotton. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, decision jungles. Uh, and this is joint work uh, with Toby Pushmeet, Sebastian, John, and Antonio. And we presented this at NIPS last year. So decision trees and forests have been uh, a great tool for us. Um, we've used them for all sorts of different applications, uh, connect body tracking, interest point detection in images, uh, organ recognition, segmentation, uh, even camera relocalization. Um, and why have they been useful? Well, because you can, you know, you, they, they're a sort of general, very general purpose classifier, uh, classification and regression tool. And they can be implemented extremely quickly, especially at test time, because you ha have this sort of conditional execution. You, you execute one, you, one feature according to what happens there. You execute another, et cetera. And that leads to a very efficient uh, runtime. However, um, there's a fairly large fundamental problem with decision trees uh, and, and forests, which is that if you give them enough data and grow them deep enough, you know, they'll get very, very large. They grow exponentially with depth, doubling each time you uh, train an extra level in your, in your, in your tree structure. Um, and this is actually a real problem, because we're now in an age where we have large data uh, and for some applications, we have infinitely large data. We can, for example, with Connect, we rendered synthetically as many uh, images as we wanted as training data. And so um, memory concerns really are a practical uh, uh, limitation for, for the adoption of, of this kind of technique um, in, in practical applications, especially perhaps mobile and embedded devices. Um, and so what we were really focusing in, on this work is how do we avoid this exponential growth with depth? What, what can we do to avoid that? And the solution we hit on was um, the use of decision DAGs. Um, and a jungle, as I'm calling it here, is really just a, a, a fun name for a, an ensemble of, of such decision DAGs. Now, a decision DAG really is exactly the same as a decision tree, except that uh, each node can have, apart from the root node, can have uh, multiple parents, potentially have multiple parents. And what we're going to do in this work is investigate a couple of ways, I'll present just one of them today in the interest of time, but a couple of ways of trying to learn uh, such structures uh, in a way that we can jointly optimize uh, both <coughs> the, the features that uh, the, the, uh, the DAG is learning and also the, the structure, the way the, uh, the layers interconnect. And um, what we found is not only did these uh, DAG structures help us with our original problem, which was thinking about the memory consumption, but actually, on the experiments I'll show you today, um, they seem to uh, help, perhaps, improve generalization and reduce overfitting. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why that might be. One is that you, you, because, you're, uh, because the way we're limiting the size of our structure, um, it means that the, the data doesn't get sort of uh, recursively uh, diluted as you go further down the tree, so you have more training data, uh, essentially, for each node. Here's another um, possible um, sort of intuition of what might be going on. And this is a very simplistic example, and it's certainly not meant to be you know, the be-all and end-all of what's going on inside these things, but it, it gives you some inkling of what might be happening. Um, so here's a very simplistic feature, two-dimensional feature space. Uh, we've got these three classes here, um, and it's going to be a sort of image patch classification task for, for, the sense, uh, for, for this example. Uh, and so we've got um, these uh, grass down here and down here. This happens to be a sort of washed-out image, so the, the grass has, uh, has come out quite white. We've got sheep that looks a little bit like grass, and we've got cow up here. Uh, so we can imagine having some more examples of these um, classes, and uh, data might live you know, roughly in that space a bit like that. 
Now, if we're trying to learn a tree, well, what you might uh, find that it does is it might split uh, first uh, vertically like that, and then on each side it will split these, uh, these guys like that. Uh, and then as we keep going down, uh, it will keep subdividing and start overfitting um, as trees are wont to do. Uh, and so you'll end up with um, this region of feature space being classified as, uh, I think this was cow, um, and, and this one here being classified as grass, whereas we might maybe have wanted it to be uh, the, the grass class down here. What we might do instead with a DAG, what might happen, uh, again, this is a very simplistic example, um, I realize, but just to give you some intuition, we might start with the same kind of uh, for initial split. We then uh, recursively split the, the, the next uh, level down, and this is exactly as it was before. But now what we can do is we can think about merging these two uh, disparate regions of feature space into one uh, node, one, into one region. And then if we continue training from there, then we, uh, we have the ability to do uh, slightly different things, such as uh, have a split across this way. Uh, and so, you know, it, it opens up the possibilities that we can uh, represent in our, in our data structure. And so what this might look like in a, in a sort of graph diagram is that, uh, you know, we have this uh, initial root node where we did this split, and then at the subsequent level, we're able to merge these two um, uh, nodes together, and then we'll, whatever, we'll keep training down here and, and do whatever we want to do. So the, 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 the generalization of the tree structure to graphs allows us to get both the traditional and ending of the feature test as you go down, but also the, uh, an oaring between different, uh, uh, feature, different paths in the tree, in the graph. Now, of course, we're not the only people who have uh, been looking at uh, decision uh, graphs and decision DAGs. Um, and here's a selection of uh, some of the uh, related work that we found. Um, I won't sort of talk through that in any great detail. Um, I think where we differ from these uh, pieces of work is that we're, we're really um, able to, to jointly learn the structure and the features, at least within uh, an individual level at a time. Um, and our experiments showed that that was actually quite an important thing to be able to do. Fine, so let's have a look at what we actually do. So how do we train these things? Uh, so let's introduce a bit of notation. Um, we're going to have, uh, we're going to train this thing a layer at a time, and within this uh, layer here, we're going to have the parent nodes up here, um, the set NP, the child nodes, the set NC, um, and we're going to index the parents with I and the children with J, and for each uh, parent node, we're going to have a set of parameters, theta I, that uh, specify what function you're going to evaluate of your uh, input feature vector. Um, and according to that uh, parameter theta i, that will induce a split into left and right subsets of your, um, of your de training data S. So it will induce a split saying that this, we get this set of examples going left and this set of examples going right. Um, and we're also going to use this notation, um, you know, li and ri to mean what, what are the allocations of the parents' Uh, left and right children in the, in the, sub, in the lower layer. Um, so all of this allows us to then uh, define what is actually quite simple, which is to say, what is the set of examples SJ that reaches a child node J? And it's simply, of course, the union of all of the um, branches out from all parents that were allocated to point to that node. So this just gives us some, some notation to say, um, First of all, we can, we can work out, uh, w given a, the response of a feature uh, and comparison and a binarization of this um, into left and right, we can decide which examples went left, which went, went right, and then at the child la layer, how they merge together. And what that allows us to do then is to define an energy function um, over jointly over all of the uh, parameters theta at the parent layer and all of the uh, left and right branching uh, parameters L and R. 
Uh, and to keep this somewhat consistent with the standard, uh, fairly standard information gain criterion that we've used in the past for training trees, um, it turns out that you, this is essentially just a generalization of, of that to the case where you have, um, you, you have this graph structure rather than the tree structure. Um, and that, um, uh, that in turn allows us to, um, you know, and, and now, so, so now we have this energy function um, and we're able to think about optimizing it. How many, how many child nodes in general are, are we going to allow for a set of parent nodes? Because that seems like that would be... Quite important. It, yeah, it's, a, it's now kind of a free parameter. It, this. Exactly. Um, so, so far, um, what we have done is, is really investigated one basic structure, which is what we're call, calling a, a decision house. So, um, it has a, or skyscraper, so it, has, it goes out um, with, you know, exponential growth to a certain limit and then goes straight down. So we're specifying a fixed uh, width on each, a uh, fixed maximum width, essentially. And in uh, principle, any, at the layer below, any of the children can be children of any of the parents at the layer mm -hmm. above? There's no restrictions on that. You could have both children from a parent going to the same node. In fact, that's one of the initialization strategies. Um, and in, it doesn't have to be this skyscraper structure. It could, you know, you could even imagine merging back down. You know, if you could learn this thing, it would, the perfect thing would be to learn back down to the number of classes and have a perfect classification for each. Um, so, how do we optimize this? And uh, here I have to, uh, you know, confess that this is in incredibly simplistic, and I'm sure there are much better ways of doing this. So, if you have any ideas, do do let me know. Um, so right now, um, as I say, we're fixing a particular uh, budget of nodes for the child layer. Um, and this sort of allows us to, if we know what our memory budget is, and we know roughly how many layers we're going to need, we can sort of define what, what this uh, M parameter should be. Um, we investigated a couple of um, very simple optimization strategies, one which I'll describe in a second, and the other um, based on uh, a clustering uh, algorithm using Bregman divergences. Um, and I refer you to the paper to look at that in a bit more detail. Um, but they both worked about the same. Um, so local search, how does that work? Well, first of all, we start with some feasible initialization, uh, and there are various ways of doing that. One that seemed to work quite well is you essentially allocate both child branches from each parent to the same uh, child. Uh, and you do that as, as much as you can, and then if you run out of uh, budget, then you start allocating where you least increase the energy. And there are, there are other strategies you can try. And then you just simply iteratively make a locally optimal um, change uh, update to, to, the allocation, to the features or to the left or right um, allocations of the chil children node. So you're just making, it's just a stochastic search algorithm. Um, and you could imagine annealing this or, or all sorts of things as well. Um, but even, even this was seeming to give us pretty decent results. So one of the beauties of this is when it comes, when that, that's it for learning. That, that's really all there, all there is to it. When it comes to test time, you, you just don't have to train, change anything. Um, if you've got decision tree code lying around that is highly optimized for you know, GPUs or whatever, um, you can just reuse that, assuming that it allows you to have pointers rather than just assuming that, uh, you know, a, a particular uh, allocation of nodes at the, at the child layer. Um, another nice thing, which we haven't probably explored yet, and, you know, this may or may not have a practical benefit, is that because you've got much smaller ensembles, they might well fit in your cache better than a large decision tree would have done. Um, and so uh, decision, decision forest would have done. And so uh, that may result in, in speed increases. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, some experiments we did. Um, so we've got a, a few baselines, um, obviously a, a sort of standard vanilla implementation of decision forests. Um, then we investigated a couple of variants of fixed width trees. Um, so the first of these is that um, rather than just growing every node, as you would in a normal decision tree, you, you rank them by uh, their, their energy, their entropy, um, and you optimize, you only continue growing the ones, the, the, top, the M over 2 uh, most energetic ones, 
which means that you end up with uh, the same size uh, 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 structure as we have with the, uh, the, the, the DAGs that we're growing. Uh, the other one is to sort of rank them and, and see which ones actually reduce the objective and, and do that. So there's a sort of variance of the same theme. Um, and then we also investigated uh, priority schedule trees where we, um, you know, you do the standard, every node gets the opportunity to grow, but you grow the um, most energetic node in order. And then we can, so, so we can rank uh, all possible trees that you could get at all stages of that growth against the accuracy. Um, and you'll see that in a second. So I just want to make sure I understand um, the most energetic intuition. So a node is going to have a high energy value if it has a lot of data points associated with it and if the classes don't <coughs> disagree yes. in that node. Agreed. If they all agree, then the entropy is zero. Exactly. And so the energy will be zero. Exactly. So lots of you know, unhappy data yes. points. Yes. If you're it. unhappy, you will, get, you will get split first um, in one of those strategies. OK, so um, here's. Uh, some first results on three different data sets here, A, B, and C. Um, let's start by, I guess, looking at the, this Connect data set. So this was a, a Connect body part classification task. Um, we're showing uh, the test segmentation accuracy as a function of the size of the, the number of nodes in the ensemble, which is a sort of proxy for memory consumption. Um, and so a few things to note. First off, the decision trees, the blue curve here, uh, does a reasonable job, but it starts to overfit uh, at around whatever this is here, 50,000 or so. Um, interestingly, the, 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 those baselines that we investigated actually do quite a lot better, especially the priority scheduled ones. That's quite, uh, we found that quite in intriguing um, and maybe worth exploring in a bit more detail. Um, but we were able to you know, get considerably um, better performance up here. Now, it, it, was, it, it was not surprising that we could get the, the horizontal gap here, that we could save memory. What was a bit surprising is that we, we got this extra generalization out there. Um, and I'm not, uh, you know, I don't want to claim that we fully understand why that is. I've given you a couple of inklings of why that might be happening. But I, I think there's plenty of scope for more investigation there. Um, similar effects perhaps even more pronounced on these other uh, data sets here. Um, I mean, if you're wondering why there's this kink in the curve, that's when the merging starts kicking in, um, when you sort of get to a certain, certain width. Now, that was memory consumption. What about compute time? Oh, yes, a question. Uh, the features in these data sets are pixels? Or? So the features in this data set, uh, I think all three of them are the same kind that we used for the connect um, body part classification, which are essentially at a pixel, you're trying to classify pixels, and at a pixel you're allowed to look at any offset neighboring pixels uh, relative, defined relative to that pixel and sort of take differences of, of their intensities. The feature space is nine dimensions? Uh, no, 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 it's not just immediate neighbors. Oh, it's, okay. it's, the feature space is very, very large, hundreds of thousands of dimensions. It's never actually explicitly computed. Um, so, that saving in memory and the potential extra generalization does come at some cost. So now I'm plotting the same y-axis, but a, uh, an x-axis, which is saying how much compute are you doing? How many of these features are you actually evaluating? Um, and so it's not, you know, that, that improvement is not coming completely for free. We are, um, let's focus on this graph, for example. We are having to do more work, quite a lot more work, um, to get that generalization. Now, my hope is, and again, we haven't fully investigated this, my hope is that uh, that might be offset a little bit by the fact that this is smaller and will fit in cache and, uh, and thereby might be, end up being you know, similarly efficient. Um, just a, you know, a very quick investigation we did here on the, the size, the width of these, these DAGs. Um, it looks like, you know, Clearly, this is going to depend on your data set and your particular scenario. Um, but there is, there is some, some effect going on there um, that, that you, would need to, you would need to think about. Um, some image results. So this is, the, this is uh, maybe I should have shown this first. This is the kind of um, 
tasks that we're, we're dealing with. Here we're trying to classify from depth pixels into uh, these body parts. Here we're trying to classify uh, RGB face images into these kind of face part images here. Um, and all of this is to show, I mean, these aren't the best possible results you could, you, you could get. We could have thrown tons more data at it, et cetera. Um, but what was slightly interesting is that you start to get these um, somewhat less noisy um, results out here and out here, um, possibly again because it might just be the better generalization means that that's what you get. It might be something, uh, something slightly uh, more interesting going on, I'm not sure. Um, some results on UCI. Um, generally, we didn't see as big improvements on UCI, but the, on some cases there was. We didn't see it ever <coughs> get worse uh, than a standard decision tree. Um, that's what you might uh, get if you uh, visualize one of these structures. This is, uh, I think, depth 60. Um, and uh, we've sort of color coded it with uh, the different classes so you can sort of see some structure coming out there. Um, fine, I better wrap up. Um, so in this uh, piece of work, we looked at generalizing decision trees to uh, decision uh, DAGs and jointly optimizing each layer in the DAG structure over both the, the structure and the, the features that uh, are extracted from the feature vector. Um, and it seems that not only can decision jungles help you with uh, memory usage, but also uh, potentially uh, get you better generalization. So thank you very much.